Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV, back with some more scintillating Q&A, where, yes, we are going to be talking catamaran sailing for probably the next hour or so. So if you're lucky enough to be tuning in live, then please do feel free to fire away with your challenging questions. Um, if you're unfortunately not able to make it live, then it's not a problem. Just any questions or interesting points that you have that you'd like brought up in the next um, Q&A, just put them in the comments below and we'll talk about them next week. Easy. Yes. So it's been two weeks now since uh, we've had a Q&A. And if you hadn't seen uh, one of the biggest um, things on Joyrider TV has been the talk of sailing events that, that you should be thinking about putting in your calendar. And already the clock is ticking with um, the one of the first main events of the season. If you're in North America, if you can get to Texas, um, I believe it's the 25th of March weekend. There's the Ides of March regatta at Texas Dyke Sailing Club um, in Texas, strangely. Um, and we're trying to make this as much of an event as possible. So if you are thinking, maybe I'm free that weekend. Yes, I've got a trailer for my boat. I could get down there. Or even, I haven't even got a boat, but I'd really like to get involved. Then get involved. If you don't know how to get involved and you haven't got a boat, you can visit the website or for the event. Uh, I'm sure it'd be on Facebook. IDES, that's I-D-E-S of March Regatta, uh, um, Texas. Just check it out. Get in touch and get involved. I think the more people that we can get down to that one, the better. And what a way to kick off the season. That is, of course, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. Um, those in the South are already enjoying some absolute fantastic conditions for the sailing season down in the Southern Hemisphere. So very good. Yes. And hello. Um, yes. Yeah, so we're going to be answering your catamaran sailing questions. Um, just checking in with everyone who's checking in. We've got Greg on board, who is a Joyrider SC member. What does that mean? That means that Greg is a member of the Joyrider TV channel. You can join the TV channel, uh, Joyrider TV channel. There's a link below every video, but not this one live. There will be afterwards. And it just costs a little bit each month. And it really helps to support Joyrider TV, as does everybody who's supporting the Joyrider TV channel on Patreon. Thank you very much for your continued support. And everybody who goes shopping at TotalJoyrider.com is supporting the channel. I'm just going to hit this now, actually. Um, I don't usually like to come in pistols blazing like this, but today I'm going to. Um, if you didn't know, uh, at the end of the summer this year, I'm hanging up my boots from my day job, which has been at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, so that I can just focus on making these very informative videos. So that means that it's you guys who are paying my wages and um, putting food on my table. So I really do appreciate all the support so much because it is giving me this opportunity to do this, which um, I clearly am into. There we are. Let's check in with everyone who's checking in. Uh, we've got Greg on board. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. He's a Joyrider SC member. Um, yeah, he's uh, Greg is one of the driving forces behind the Ides of March regatta in Texas. Um, there are prizes up for grabs from Joyrider TV. So, uh, even more incentive to get there. We've got Scott on board, dropping it in the slot. Uh, good morning. I keep forgetting it's the morning for a lot of you guys. 
All right, we've got, uh, unfortunately, my ability to read Russian text is limited. So I don't know what that says, but hello, and I'm glad you could make it. We've got BJVDB, to wax or not to wax the holes. That's a good one. Um, should we just talk about that now? I think we should. Uh, waxing or polishing the holes. I think perhaps, yeah, hmm. I think the first thing that we need to make sure with the hulls and the foils, it, well, first question is, are we going for aesthetics, how the boat looks, or are we going for making the boat as fast as possible? That is the question. If the answer is we want that boat looking showroom fresh, ready to go to the nationals and show it off on the beach, then very nice. Then in that case, let's get waxing. But before we get waxing, let's clean the holes as much as we can um, using some sort of um, proper boat hull cleaning solution. Uh, we have been using um, a, what do you call it? Like a a cleaning agent, which has muracic acid in it, which I'm not sure how good that is for the hulls, but it certainly gets rid of all of the brown stains from the hulls. So we want to get rid of any marks from the hulls first. And then what I would then do, um, perhaps depending on the age of your boat, if you've got an older boat, I would get some very, very fine, the finest you can find, uh, wet and dry paper and just give it a nice smoothing with that to take out any subtle imperfections from the hulls. Um, and then I would say if I was looking to make the boat as fast as possible, that is where I would leave it. I wouldn't then polish the hulls because I'm not sure if anybody on um, tuned in is um, a physicist, perhaps. Uh, who works in fluid dynamics and that sort of thing. But um, if, but I think the non-shiny hull is faster than the shiny hull for top speed. Put it in the comments below or in the live chat if you know more than I do about this, which there is quite a strong chance about. Um, yeah, so I would leave it at that. But if you do want the boat to look as good as possible, then let's get polishing, baby. Um, wax on, wax off, Daniel Sun. Thank you very much. That's a good start. Let's talk about wax. All right. We got hands on board. Guten Tag, Hans, from the German Highway. Cool. I hope you're going somewhere nice. Uh, nice weekend for it. Well, it's a nice weekend here. We've got very nice weather here in um, the south of Lefkas Island, Greece, wall-to-wall uh, -wall sunshine and the promise of some good wind tomorrow. So very much looking forward to, um, I'm actually thinking that maybe tomorrow is going to be my first time back on the water since surgery in November. So uh, that is potentially exciting, but not on a boat, I'm afraid. All right. We've got Stefan on board in Canada. Good morning. Great to have you with us. All right. And BJVDB is from the Netherlands. That's Holland to everyone else. But uh, yeah, great to be touching the corners of the planet already. Hans is tuned in with Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Great to have you tuned in there, probably in a car, probably with a dog in the back. Hopefully the dog is still with you guys. All right, Pierre is on board in Quebec, Canada. Great stuff. All right, Greg says, recently attended a sailing seminar dedicated to larger monohull racing. Huge advantage on new jib for them. How much would you, race, would you rate a crisp new class jib? Big help for us or not critical? Yeah, it now, so just to... Um, what do you, 
what's the word? Um, summarize Greg's question there is will having a new jib on your boat make a big difference if you're racing? Yes. Um, depends on the age of the old jib to a certain degree. And it depends on how far you are up the fleet. Because um, let's say in the bottom half, I'll try to draw something here. So if this is, let's, if this is the fleet, what? Um, yeah, if this is the fleet, then this is, this is first and this is last. Now, it, somebody does have to come last. That's just the way that things work. But if you're down, if you are generally finishing in the bottom third of the fleet, is a new jib or new sails going to make a big difference? If you're not sailing in the Olympic Games, um, then the chances are your uh, results can be much improved through better boat handling and better boat speed using the equipment that you have. So um, I would say if this is the arena in which you are generally finishing, getting a new jib, yeah, it's going to be psychologically very nice unless it's windy and between races that bad boy's flapping a bit. It's you're not going to enjoy that one bit. The noise of a brand new jib flapping, especially if it's the Mylar jib like you'd have on your Hobie 20. Um, when that's flapping, you can visualize five dollar notes just coming off the leech of that bad boy. Every flap, it's just degrading the cloth. So, um, yeah, it's painful. New jibs also are a lot louder when they flap. Now, this is actually another big bonus of the Hobie 16 with the fully battened Dacron jib. This is a rarity uh, in any type of boat, but the 16 jibs, unless it's in excess of 25 knots, don't generally flap because the battens hold them um sort of solid enough so they're not going to flap and it being made of dacron if it does flap a little bit it's not going to damage the sails so much so bottom third i would say don't buy a new jib just make sure everything on your boat is working as it should do if like every time you tack if the jib sheet gets caught around the base of the mast something like that which costs you a bit of, um, what's the word, like um, frustration, um, a bit of time sorting it out every time you tack, rather than buying a new jib, maybe spend a few quid on a little bit of elastic to stop the jib sheets getting caught around the base of the mast, that kind of thing. Work on your tacks in between races um, or when you're not out racing. This is something that I was going to talk about in a specific video. But when you go out sailing and you're not racing, go out and spend a bit of the time that you're out sailing focused training. Even if it's just 20 minutes out of a whole day, if you say, right, for the next 20 minutes, we're going to do a load of tacks. Um, we're going to do um, 10 tacks in the next 20 minutes set your watch to beep every however often and then tack every minute or two minutes and just after each tack analyze what you've just done and see how you could improve it that is going to move you up from there better than new sales unless your sales are so bad that they're going to rip in half now if you're in the middle. Then we're getting into the kind of, yes, it's more likely to help. 
because if you're in the middle, then hopefully that would mean that you've been racing or, or sailing catamarans for long enough that you have got your maneuvers, your boat handling and your boat speed reasonably proficient, which means then um, putting crispy new sails on the boat is going to make the boat, um, you're going to notice more performance, especially upwind on the boat with a new jib, especially. Um, if your jib has battens, pay attention to what battens you're putting in it as well. Find out from the class how stiff the battens should be in the sails. Um, and changing the battens might have a reasonably significant effect um, if you get, like, if we talk mainsail, if you get a brand new mainsail, but you have a real mixed bag of old battens in, some made of, like, uh, corrugated fiberglass, some foam ones, a couple of wooden ones chucked in there, some which are taped together, then that new sail is going to be operating at about i don't know 60 percent of its potential so perhaps before investing this controversial this is perhaps before investing in a new mainsail especially or if you've got a fully battened jib maybe think about taking your battens out have a look at your battens and um and check to see that they are even mm. Um, but yes, if if the baton, but yes, a new jib is going to help if you are in the middle of the fleet for sure. And then at the front of the fleet, it just basically depends on when you replaced your jib last. Um, but if your jib is a few seasons old and it's starting to look a bit baggy, the shape isn't very good, then yes, absolutely, a new jib is really going to help you to blast off uh, on from the start line on your upwind leg, especially. Um, it's going to help. Oh, yeah. But a lot, it's everything is connected in making the boat go faster. What you do with the tiller extension, the main sheet, the jib sheet, how your rig is set up as well. So perhaps... If you go to an event and there's other Hobie 20s, like perhaps on your calendar this year, Greg, is the Hobie 20 Nationals. I certainly would if I was in the States. That would be one of the great events of the season. Um, go to the Nationals and talk to the guys who are in the top 10% top of the fleet and find out how they set their boat up and just copy whoever in the top 10%, whoever is in the same sort of weight as you are sailing at, then copy their settings and that should work for you. Mm. Stuff like that. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, should you buy a new jib? Yes and no. Uh, depends on where you are. Um, but it's very nice just to have a brand new jib that you just keep for one event every year, like the jib on Bad Boy 94, My Tornado, um, only comes out for going to competitions. And I think I used it one other time in the season uh, last year. There we go. All right. I'm just lubricating as we go. Nice. All right. So we've got Clive on board. Uh, Clive's got a keen eye, so it seems, says great looking sweatshirt there. Yes, this is the all new, this is the newest design at TotalJoyRider.com and it is called the Glossary of Sailing Terms. If you, if if I was filming in 4K here and you could zoom in tight, you could actually read it. Um, it's got it all there, like cooking the goose, giving it the beans down the mine shaft. Everything is there. Um, of course, everything at TotalJoyRider.com, you can customise. So if you want something like this, but you want a Hobie 20 in the middle, or perhaps a Hurricane 5.9, a Tornado, Hobie 18, Hobie Wave, uh, Dart 16, anything at all, um, 
I'm not a graphic designer, but I have a pretty good go. <laughs> And I do all the designs myself. So there we go. Thank you, Clive. All right. Stefan says, regarding cleaning the holes, is it safe to high pressure wash the fiberglass holes with hot water? Yeah, I've, I've definitely to use a high pressure. It. Mm, I'm just backpedaling here a bit, actually. I would say definitely yes, unless your boat is very old and... I would check it on a not quite so delicate area. Just give it a little go just on the outside of the hull first and perhaps ease back a little bit on your high pressure hose uh, before giving it the absolute juice um, or, or give it the juice and see what comes loose. All right. Um, yeah, but with a new boat, no problem at all. we pressure wash all of our monohulls every year because they've got the grip on which means if you do try to clean them like with a sponge or something it just disintegrates the sponge so it is something that we must do all right we've got frederick with us greetings from snowy sweden got a tiger from 2005 nice choice with a black mast what is the best method to get to look as sharp as possible yeah that's tricky, actually, to bring a mast back. Once the black ones, if they've been out outdoors a lot, they start to go a kind of purple colour. And getting it back to black is tricky. I use, uh, personally, I just use my homemade salad dressing mast cleaner, which is basically a combination, well, I take a big pot, like, uh, what would it be, like five litres of vinegar, uh, decant, uh, pour away into another container, maybe half of it. And then we're quite lucky here. We have a lot of lemons growing. So I chop up a load of lemons, put them in the vinegar, leave it for a couple of weeks. And then that makes a really good uh, mast cleaning solution which does seem to help a bit. But once your mask started going purple, uh, unfortunately, my scientific knowledge uh, doesn't go that far. I'm afraid. But the salad dressing, also very good on your salad, as well as for cleaning the mask. All right, sorry, I can't help you more on that. But um, once... I think once the mask started going purple, then maybe a wider Google search is required. All right, I've got Christian on board. Can you give a quick explanation of mast rake? Yes. That's the sort of thing we're into around here, uh, talking about mast rake and such. All right, so... What we're doing with the mast rake, we're drawing a very simple boat here. Now, so this is the hull and this is the dagger board, but it really doesn't matter if it's a dagger board or if it's, let's, we're doing different colors now, uh, a skeg hull like on a Dart 18, um, or if it's, what other colour have I got? Or if it's an asymmetric hull, like on a, a Hobie Cat or a Prindle, um, then it really doesn't matter. But what we've got here under the water is what we call our centre of lateral resistance. This is what you might call the pivot point on the hull. When we turn the boat, there is some part of the hull which it kind of pivots on. Um, so if it's a dagger board, that's quite obvious. That is going to be a very centralised spot where uh, the boat pivots. If it's a skeg hull, then the area where it pivots is going to be spread over a larger distance, like 
all of that, then if it's a an asymmetric hull, like on any boat which is kind of banana shaped, um, then it's going to be spread over a much longer distance of the hull, that pivot point, which means it's much easier to get the mast rake right when we're sailing with a boat with dagger boards or center boards because we've got a much more focused pivot point on the hull. So that is our center of lateral resistance. So let's put the mast up. So with our rig, what we've got on the rig, and uh, let's just talk, let's just talk mainsail only is we've got what's called the center of effort. Um, and that is where most of the pull is coming from on the mainsail. Now, this can be altered before we get into the mast rake. This can be altered by using the mast rotation and the downhaul. Uh, just very quickly with the downhaul, when we pull the downhaul on really hard, it flattens the sail and moves our center of effort down and forwards, which is really what we want because center of effort nice and far forwards means it's really going to pull the boat forwards. If the center of effort in the sail is further back, in the sail that is, not in the rig, in the sail, then that's going to put the power just making the boat want to fly the hull and not necessarily want to go forwards. So let's just draw the profile here. It's quite exaggerated, of course. Um, so with the downhaul loose, looser, um, we want all this shape in the sail for power, but the center of effort is like here so it's gonna and the the drive from the center of effort is going to be kind of perpendicular 90 degrees to that so it really is just going to work to make the boat want to lift the hull once the wind gets any stronger whereas with the downhaul pull tight center of effort goes further forwards which means the drive is then it's not going to be directly forwards that drive, but it's going to be more forwards, which is going to make the boat go faster. And it's also going to flatten this back part of the sail, making it more efficient for the high winds. But that's not talking about mast rake. So if we say generally the center of effort is kind of here. Nice. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put the center of effort just behind, just behind the center of lateral resistance. So on the boat with dagger boards, what we're trying to do is line the middle of that up with the back part of the dagger boards. Then what that means is that I'm going to have to draw another picture here. Um, how small can we go? How low can we go? Here we go. So by putting by putting the center of effort slightly behind the center of lateral resistance, that means that it's getting the push is here which means that is really going to help the boat to go upwind. And you'll actually feel it if you let go of the, the rudders when your mast is just right and uh, you've got the centre of effort just behind the centre of lateral resistance. When you let go of the rudders, the boat will just gently 
turn up into the wind. And that is the sweet spot. That's what we're looking for. Um, what we never want is the centre of effort in front of the centre of lateral resistance. Because if we do that, when we let go of the tiller extension, the rudders, the boat will turn downwind. And um, that's really dangerous. But also, it means the boat isn't going to point very well upwind, which um, upwind is really where we're trying to do everything we possibly can to make the boat sail faster, sail um, closer to the wind. There we go. So if there's more wind, what we would generally do if we're going to change the mast rake is we put the mast more to the back. And then if there's less wind, we have it more kind of like how we have it here with it lined up. So more to the back and then more forwards in the lighter winds. Now, if you're sailing a boat like a Hobie 16 or 14, we've got something else to contend with, which is the space between the boom and the back cross beam. If we put the mast back too far, the boom's going to be like this, and we're not actually going to be able to get any tension in the back edge of the sail because we can't get any tension in the blocks. So the way of gauging what is the maximum on a boat like a 16 or a 14 is put it back as far as you can, pull the main sheet in with two hands. If with two hands or if with one hand, it's really easy to get it the blocks to come all the way together, then that means you've got too much mast rake and you need to do something about it. There we go. I could go on all day about this, but I feel there are some other questions that may need attention. Hope that helps so Christian. Um, all right, Jose says, the mad catter regatta, in Oneida Lake in central New York, May the 19th to the 21st. You heard it here. Uh, maybe you heard it here somewhere else. You heard it somewhere else first, but you're hearing it here now. Um, are you in New York or can you get to New York State in May 19th? Take your boat. Or like I said about the Ides of March, just um, get in touch through... I'm sure there's a Facebook page for this one as well. Um, but get in touch and um, just say, I really want to come to the event, but I haven't got a boat. What can I do? Is anybody looking for a crew? That kind of thing. Or if no one's looking for a crew, can I help out on um, the committee boat? Or can I just, or other than that, you could just go to the event, hang out and soak up the atmosphere. Look at some boats. Nice. All right. All right. We've got Ollie Smith on board. He's going to be one of the pioneers out here this year. Um, yeah. So uh, Ollie and Ash, our opening team for Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, are coming out next weekend um, to start with some stuff in order to get our sailing centre back up to speed on the topic of the wild wind sailing center um if you're on instagram you'll know this already but um i've just had two days ago uh the delivery from starting line sailing that's the company who is now responsible for the production of hobie cat everywhere in the world but we've just had the delivery from those guys of not five not six but seven brand new masts for Hobie Pacifics and Tigers. Oh, yes, those bad boys are going to be straight and stiff, not purple. They'll be black, but they're very expensive. Buying a new mast is no picnic. If anybody would like to buy a used Hobie Tiger or Hobie Pacific mast, then I seem to have seven available. Yes, and also we had delivery of four Hobie 16s, which were from, which were new from last year's 
World Championships in Spain. And maybe in the next days, I'm going to put one together and film it to make a new building a 16 out of a box video. Fun. That's what I'm into. Um, all right. Greg says, um, my sales are in decent shape. I'll hold off. Good. That's going to save a bit of cash as well. We are still in the bottom section and making many mistakes, maybe get to the middle this year. Yeah. And to be honest, the noise of a brand new jib when it's windy, it's, it doesn't, it's not a good selling point. All right. Frederick says the mast is more gray than black. Yeah. Gray, purple. Yeah. Unfortunately, I would do an extended Google search and find some science out there. Let us know how you get on. Greg's also signed up in the Hobie 20 Nationals, Oklahoma City in the US. All right, we got Russell on board. Who says, have we got any advice on trailering catamarans? Um, yeah, I suppose, what would the advice be? This is quite a broad question. Um, I think the first piece of advice is make sure that your trailer is in good shape. Uh, check the running gear on your trailer. Check the wheel bearings or take it to someone who can give it a service to give you that peace of mind. What you want when you're towing a boat or anything at all is because whatever you're towing is kind of detached from you and your car or your truck. Um, so you want to have the peace of mind, but what you're towing down the highway is going to still be there when you arrive at your destination. So number one, get the trailer serviced. Um, number two, um, I would generally put the boat as far forwards on the trailer as possible, but consider how, what is the tightest you are going to turn. If you get your reversing wrong and you kind of, there's a term uh, called jackknifing, um, which is if you're going backwards and you turn too sharply. Sorry, I'm going to draw a picture. Oi, oi. Oh, it's all happening here. All right. car, tow bar, just there, and trailer, if you go too sharp, if you turn too sharply backwards, the trailer can kind of, if that's the center of the trailer, so the boat would be kind of like that. There's the wheels there. And just consider how far forwards you've put the boat on the trailer that if you have a mild jackknifing, is the boat going to hit your car? Mm. Um, but we want to have the boat as far forwards as possible. Two reasons. One is we want the trailer to have a good amount of weight in the front, in the hitch, because too much weight in the back makes the trailer um, very unpredictable to tow. Um, and also, if we do have any sort of malfunction with the hitch, it could just jump off. And also, by having it further forwards, you're making your whole vehicle a bit shorter, which is certainly going to help. Um, yeah, so that is number one. Um, the same thing goes for the mast. Um, I would generally try to have the mast. So there's... Um, what's called the mast crutch. That's the bit that holds the mast. I would try to have no more than about half a meter, you know, like about a foot or two of mast beyond the back of the boat. So the mast, here we go. Uh, a fair bit of mast forwards, not very much mast back. In um, many countries, you're not actually allowed to have any part of your trailer more than one metre further back than your lights. So 
having the mast further forwards is good. But of course, again, depends what your towing vehicle is. If it's a van, like a camper van, especially, um, you've got to be careful that the mast isn't too close to the roof of the van. Because if you go down a, a dip, then the mast going to hit the roof of your van. So that's something to consider there. And then I would really go to town in making sure the trailer is adequately padded and really uh, get some new straps, unless your straps are new already, as wide straps as you can find. Don't use the ratchet straps because your fiberglass hulls are not going to thank you for that but the straps with a regular buckle and really crank them on um, depends what type of boat to a certain extent. If you've got a kind of softer hulled boat, like a tornado, you don't want to be cranking it on quite as hard. Whereas if you've got a boat, which is very hard, like a Hobie 16 or a Prindle uh, 15, 16, 18, then you can really wind them on hard to make sure that's not going to move. Do as much preparation as you can um, because that is going to give you help to give you that peace of mind that you need. I hope that helps there, Russell. Um, it's a big topic, towing, trailering. Yeah. At this stage in the game, we've been going 41 minutes. So I'm going to take a short commercial break. But no need for any commercials today. Um, did all that at the start, I believe. All right, we got Hanny on board back from Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius was great. Sailing there was great. Yeah, good times in Mauritius. Such good sailing, good times. What a great atmosphere. And the guys working there are all legends. Oh, yes. If anyone from Mauritius is watching, you know who you are. And you know that you're legends. Well done. Glad you had a good time, Hanny. Got Robert on board from the mountains of New Hampshire, USA. Where, it, all right, where exactly is this whole vent folks talk about on Hobie 16s? I've got a 1985. Yeah, so what Robert is asking there is on a Hobie 16 hull, um, and on a lot of hulls, actually, there is a small hole deliberately in the hull to allow air to pass in and out to stop there from being a vacuum inside the hull. If there wasn't a small hole in the hull and you left your bungs in and the boat had a good steel, if you go through some big um, temperature changes, this vacuum could actually really cave the holes in. We've seen it before um, because it's uh, quite hot here in Greece with the lasers, especially with the holes deforming because the, the venting holes were blocked and the bungs were left in. But in a Hobie 16, the uh, venting holes are actually inside the pylon of the front. Uh, so if very quick drawing. Um, this is on the Hobie 16 hull. These are what we call the pylons. And it's if you take your boat apart, you'll actually see the end of it. It's like a little tube sticking out. And that is where this ventilation hole is. Um, and yes, it does mean the boat is likely to take a bit of water in if you're capsized. But if, like the video that's about to be made about putting your boat together, if you use grease when you put, something just happened. That was weird. Um, oh, computer just changed to nighttime mode. So everything changed color. Um, if you use grease when you put the beams onto the pylons, that grease should stop any water from getting inside. And we're off to the races. There we go. All right, we've got Cux Oli on board from Northern Germany. Great to have you on board. We've got Paul on board in Northern Italy. We've got all the Northerners with us today. 
Good to have you with us, Paul. Not long now. And I don't know if you caught it earlier, Paul. Paul was asking. But yes, the new 16s have arrived. And when I build the first one, oh, yes, of course, you are all going to know about it. This will be plastered all over the internet. Um, so stay tuned. Well, I've got Max with us. 17.37 knots today at Lake Simsey. Hold on, I'll just make a note of that and I'll get it on the speed stick. 17.37 Simsey. All right, Max. Let's know what type of boat. Oh, you've you've put it there. Nacra into 18. So I'm just making notes as we go. Is that okay? Inter. If you could just let us know, Max, who it was you were sailing with, I'm sure they'd like to be on the stick as well. That would be great. All right. So we've got Willem on board watching from South Africa. Nice. What dinghies have you? I love this sort of question. Brilliant. Because it's really easy. Um what dinghies have you sailed? We have a 505. Well, you're not going to believe it. But um, back in the early days, I did do uh, some 505 sailing. My um, sailing club in the UK was a very popular 505 sailing club. So much so that we actually hosted the world championships back in, God, it must have been about 89 uh, I think we hosted the world championships. I was on the committee boat for that. Didn't sail because the the com competition in the 505 fleet is fierce. But I've sailed a lot of dinghies. Actually, I started off with a Wayfarer, which is an open 16 feet long boat. And the Mirror dinghy, which is the smaller boat. Um, the Topper, Laser, uh, Laser Pico. God, there's been a lot, actually. Um, what have been some of the highlights? The 505, definitely. Used to sail a fireball quite a lot, which is a two-man, single trapeze, spinnaker boat. Um, pretty fast uh, back in the day. Still pretty fast now. The fireball, very good. Um, I sailed a firefly, which is uh, very popular for team racing these days in the universities. Um, yeah, quite a lot. And then when I was working in the UK as a sailing instructor, I, sa I sailed probably the first ever Laser 5000. Oh, yeah. Like a small 18 foot skiff. Sailed the Laser 4000 as well, the 3000. Uh, sailed the Laser 2, the Laser 2 Fun, which was a prototype boat. Um, with a massive asymmetric spinnaker. Yes, that was fun. It really was. Um, loads of different things. Uh, 49er, of course, RS800, RS500. First time last year, in fact. We've had them in Greece for a very long time. Uh, so I finally got round to having a go on one. Yeah, so quite a few different um, monoholes I've uh, tickled over the years. I am quite old. Although I, I, I know I have got this use, youthful appearance, but I am knocking on a bit and been round the sailing boat park several times. Thanks for the question, Willem. And greetings to South Africa and everyone else in South Africa. Why do not more South Africans get involved with Joyrider TV? That is a question for you guys. Anyway. All right. We've got Shane on board from Ireland. Great to have you with us, Shane. We've got Lee on board. Uh, hello to Joe and the Joy Riders from Macon, Georgia. Willis is with us. Hi, Willis. Great to have you back, um, as always. All right. Shane in Ireland says, would you look out for a Hobie 16 from a certain era? No, I, um, to be honest, my knowledge of the Hobie, of the Hobie 16 timeline isn't as good as my knowledge of the Hobie Tiger timeline because I was with the Hobie Tiger right from when it came out. Whereas the 16 
it's been out for a long time. I know there was some significant changes made to the Hobie 16 um, around the year 2000. So if you've got the choice of getting a 16, which is from t basically less than 23 years old, which a, 2000, a year 2000 Hobie 16 is actually 23 years old, but it still sounds pretty recent. That's how solid Hobie 16s are. But that's not to say that older boats are bad. Um, they just, that's before the various little upgrades in the construction, in the fittings on the boat. And um, it was, I think, about 2000 when the European boats, this Aussie style jib halyard, where you've got the purchase on the jib and the six to one downhaul system became uh, normal. That's all I can tell you on that topic. Um, but if you're looking at some boats, Shane, and um, you're not sure if one looks like it's worth a go or not, send me some pictures. My email address is in any episode of Show Us Your Cat in the, in the description. Send me an email and I'll have a look at it for you and let you know what I think. There we go. All right, we've got Old Reliable on board. It's great to have you with us. I run a membership for 400 monohull keelboat sailors in New York City. All levels. How would you get them excited to take an adventure to try dinghy sailing in Greece? How would I get them excited? I, I would just get them to watch some of the videos on Joyrider TV. I think that is as exciting as you would ever need to know. Um, but um, get over to the Wildwind website. That's just wildwind.co.uk. Um, but yeah, it's really worth the trip. And more and more people are making the journey from the USA to Greece now to come sailing with us, which is really great to see. But um, I think the videos of the action just speak for themselves. But if you want more, send me an email and we can talk about it. All right. Um, so we've been going 52 minutes now. If I could just say no further questions, please, in the live chat, because I have got some preloaded questions that we need to look at. Um, that would be great if I could just get on to those. But Dobie's just just uh, just tuned in. He's a bit late, not to worry. He's going to watch later from the beginning. Very wise, as should everyone uh, watch this twice. All right, let's look at what we've got in the, if I can find my preloaded questions. Sorry. Um, all right, first one. This is an easy one. This is from Bobby Bruce, who says, what are the best options for the trapeze harness? Anybody who has watched Joyrider TV for any length of time will know that I am absolutely sold on the Magic Marine Smart Harness. Um, the Smart Harness from Magic Marine is actually the bottom of their range of trapeze harnesses, but it does everything that you need. Very comfortable. It's got a quick, re you definitely need a quick release on your spreader bar. So if things go wrong, you can get rid of the hook. And the Magic Marine harnesses all have that as standard. Um, yeah, the Magic Marine smart harness. If you've got back problems, that would be when I would suggest looking at the more up the range models. But for most people, it's got an adjustable back support anyway. It's very flexible. It's not a stiff one. So it moves with you. It's not bulky. It's comfortable. They're usually black. Uh, yeah, and it's the cheapest in the range. That is what I would say on the topic of which trapeze harness to go for. Next one, we've got Adele, who says, oh, yeah, I've been here 
the cap on the end of my Hobie Tiger mast has perished and cracked. I'm concerned that when we capsize, the mast will fill with water. Is there an easy fix or is there a replacement part? There is a replacement part. Um, you could just speak to your local, your localist Hobie dealer. Uh, I Sorry, I don't know where you are, but um, you can order a new one. Um, on the Hobie Tiger, for those of you who are not Hobie Tiger sailors, I think this is probably the only boat that has this. But the top of the mast, there's the top of the mast. It actually has like a, a rubber boot that just goes over the top. And yes, over time, these do become brittle and crack. But what we've got inside the mast at the top, so we're now looking down the mast, is we actually have a metal plate inside the mast. And then, so that metal plate, let's say that's red. So that metal plate would be inside the mast. And then below that metal plate, there is a foam plug, which fits perfectly inside the mast. And that occupies probably about that much space, maybe a bit less. What's that? Uh, about 15, 20 centimetres, this foam plug. And then the foam plug at the bottom there is sealant at the top. There's sealant. There's sealant around the metal plate. So, yes, that rubber cap on the top does add to the waterproofness of the mast, but it's not absolutely critical. I'd say if it's cracking, then before you go sailing, I would just take that off completely and then have a look at the metal plate and just check to see that the seal is good around that metal plate. And if necessary, reseal that uh, before going sailing. So if you do turn the boat um, over, it's less likely to fill with water. But yes, putting a new rubber seal on top of the mast is going to give you that extra bit of confidence and peace of mind. All right. Johnny One says the FX1 has the cap on top of the mast as well. Of course. Yes, yeah, sorry, you caught me out there. As does the Hobie Fox, if anyone was about to say that, sorry. But um, because all of those masts are from the same, um, they're just from the same. Yeah. All right. Next preloaded question. This one comes from Matthew. And this is an interesting one. And we need to find a solution to this. And in fact, Scott, who I don't know if Scott's still on board, but um, it's about meeting up with other sailors while you're traveling. So just to summarize Matthew's question, is there any good online sites or forums that anybody uses? Put it in the comments below. Um, or in the live chat, um, if you know about any solutions to this, do you know any online sites or forums that you use for meeting up with other sailors while traveling? Um, Matthew says, I travel all over for a living and would love to go sailing with others while traveling, but it's nearly impossible to find out about other local sailors. Do you or anyone in the live chat, Joyrider TV community, uh, recommend any forums or social media places to meet up with local sailors willing to take others out? I'll try to be on live this week to hear what you have to say. Yeah, it's a great question, Matthew. And I'm just thinking as we go here and what I don't, as far as I know, there's not a central any we're set up for doing exactly that but perhaps what we could do i don't even know if it's possible but perhaps 
on the Total Joyrider Facebook page, I could see if it's possible just to put like some sort of chat room there where people can just freely uh, just chat like an open forum, not in topics or anything. Um, and you could just put in that chat room, I'm coming to, uh, where would you be coming to? Probably to the Texas City Dyke Sailing Club. Um, and you put, coming to this venue on this date, um, would anybody be around uh, who could take me out for a sail? Um, not fussy about what type of boat, that kind of thing. So I'm going to do some um, investigation to see if that is possible to set up some sort of chat room on the Facebook page, because that I think would be very valuable um, to many people. Just think if wherever you were going, um, you're never far away from a lake or the water and there's bound to be someone with a boat nearby who watches Joyrider TV, of course. All right, next in the live chat, Ryan is on board uh, in Maui. Uh, Ryan looks after bees, incidentally. Uh, heavy rains, he says. Again, nice to catch up the last minute. Happy Friday. Yeah, we're... I'm almost at the other end of Friday to uh, to you Hawaiians. All right, we've got Lo or Lao Jubert. Nice to have you on board. I believe I don't recall having heard from you before. So welcome. Great to have you with us. I've heard you say many times that if you want to leave a Hobie 16 for a while, you should release the downhaul. Why does this help? And how does it work? It's a good question. All right. Any type of boat, in fact. Um, monohull or catamaran, um, any type of boat. If you're the downhaul, you should consider as the on switch for the boat. Uh, so if you're not with the boat or not immediately going to use the boat, or not actually sailing the boat, you should keep the downhaul loose. I don't actually pull the downhaul on until I'm underway. Um, why, you may ask. Right. Looking at the sail from above, when we pull the downhaul on, the sail gets its shape like a big curve, like a wing. With the downhaul off, the sail has no shape. This is quite a quick, quick answer, actually. Uh, with no downhaul on, the sail has no shape and it will just hang like a flag. Be very stable. Um, even if it's windy, it won't really flap very much with a fully battened sail like we have on the catamarans. Um, but as soon as you pull the downhaul on, what happens if there's much? Well, the first thing is, any amount of wind, um, you know, above, I don't know, four knots, five knots, because we've got this massive bit of shape in the sail, it means if any bit of wind comes along, it's going to catch the sail and it could actually capsize the boat um, on the land or wherever it is if it's unattended, which we obviously don't want. So that's reason one. But when it gets windy, this is when it becomes a real issue, is what happens is because if the wind is blowing onto the rig like that, like if the boat is sitting into the wind, what happens is the sail is going to start flogging extremely violently if it's got the downhaul on. So the wind is going to hit this side. then all the battens are going to pop to this side. Wind's going to hit this side and it's going to pop back and it's going to just continuously be doing that. And it's like bang, 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 bang. And of course the boom swinging about, it's dangerous. So, um, and also it's noisy as well. So for that reason, I don't put the downhaul on until I'm ready to start sailing the boat properly. 
And I apply that to all different wind strengths as well. Um, there we go. All right, another question that I was wondering. You also mentioned that in light winds, you should pull the vo force stay very tight. Uh, sorry, in light wind and in... You mentioned that in light winds, you should pull the force stay very tight and in light winds, less so. Why is this? All right, so in... In in uh, in light winds, yes, we put loads of tension on the forestay of or on the jib halyard of the Hobie sixteen. What that does is it tightens the rig completely, and it means as we look, basically we lose less power. So we're harnessing more wind because if we look straight on from the front or the back of the boat, this is still our wind, by the way. Um, there's the trampoline. We have two boats here. Now this one's got a tight rig. And the mast stays very upright as we look at it from the back or the front. Um, whereas if we haven't got it, pardon, tight, the wind is going to blow it over to the side. And this is actually going to spill a load of power. This is why it's good to loosen the rig. And there's many reasons, but uh, when it's windy, that is why we loosen the rig off on the 16, not on the bigger boats, on like the bigger boats, like the Formula 18 or Tornado, Hobie 20. We don't loosen the rig when it's windy. We keep that bad boy tight. In fact, tighter when it's windy. For lighter teams on a bigger boat, you want a tighter rig because that is how you depower more. Uh, on those boats, but on a 16 or something similar like Prindle 16, Hobie 14, Dart 15, um, anything like this, loosening the rig is going to allow it to fall away to leeward, which is going to help us to lose power. But that is why we're keeping the rig tight in light winds. Now, in very light winds, we want to have it a little bit looser because in very light winds, there's not enough energy to rotate the mast. So we need the rig a bit looser so the mast will rotate easier. And also having the uh, mast leaning over slightly helps kind of gravity to sit in the sail a bit. Gravity to help the wind sit in the sail a bit, which helps uh, to keep the wind stuck to the sail to help us go. Maybe. We'll see about that. Um, I'm just making that bit up, actually, but it sounds good. <laughs> OK, so there we go. All right. Ryan says, how about a global map with pins? Yeah, that would be very cool. If anybody does websites who's watching and has any ideas for this global chat room uh, with um, a sort of exchange scheme where people come and have a go on your boat. You might become really great friends. Then you might even decide to visit the other part of the country where the other guy came from and uh, go for a sail on his boat. Could be a beautiful thing, but we need to work out how we're going to do it. And it's up to the Joyrider TV global community to work out how to do it. Because, you know, I'm, I can talk about rudder tuning all day long, but about uh, things on websites, it's not my strong point. All right, Scott says, I've had the best luck in finding people to sail with, thanks to Joe and his connections and through the Friday Q&As. That's a good start, actually, because um, what Scott has been doing is uh, asking in the Q&A, and then emailing me afterwards and saying, could you, do you know anybody in a specific area who might be up for taking me for a spin? Because through doing Show Us Your Cat and the Q&A and everything, I've met people from all over the world. 
Uh, so there is a chance. So I'm happy to reach out on behalf of other people. All right. So, oh, Lowe is in South Africa as well. So having said, where is everybody from South Africa? There's um, more South Africans today on the Q in the Q&A than we've had. So great to have you with us. Keith's on board from Minnesota. Can't wait for warm we weather. Yeah, I think we're all feeling that a bit apart from everyone in South Africa, of course, who's um, probably enjoying the good stuff. Uh, good question. Good answer. Intro to the downhaul. Nice. Toots on board. Hello, Toot. Uh, good to have you with us as always. All right. Ryan says, when there are heavy rain and potential flooding from a Kona low depression, how soon should I go and check on the boats on the beach? Yeah, I would say this is a good point. If if it's looking stormy um, and it could flood where your boat is, first step, get the mast down, drop the mast. Without the mast up, there's much less for the wind to get hold of. Of course, um, your boat should always be anchored securely to the floor whenever you're not with it. Always. Um, otherwise, you never know. You're asking for trouble. If you don't tie your boat to the floor, you are asking for trouble. But if it looks like it's going to be particularly ferocious, drop the mast and then tie the mast to the boat because that extra weight of the mast might even help. But if if where your boat's parked might flood, I would prefer to take the boat somewhere else if I had the chance. That is a serious answer. Um, and I hope that everything's all right there, Ryan. Sounds pretty fruity. Um, all right. OK, so on the question of uh, rig tension, Lowe says less tight in stronger winds. but um, Somehow I knew what he was talking about. Perfect. Good. All right. So we're almost at the finish line now. We've got ja Jad Ranker on board. Sorry, I had to really zoom in to get your name there. Hello. Great to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. Okay. Toot says, I met Carl L. on this chat room and sold him, sold him a NACRA 6.0. Yeah, that's what we need. We need a constantly active chat room like the live chat here. But if we can do that, I've, I'm happy to host it on my website or on the Total Joyrider Facebook page. If we can do that, then off we go. Or I could set up on the Joyrider TV YouTube community tab perhaps every week. I just put a post on there saying something along the lines of if anybody wants to reach out to anybody else in the Joyrider community, put it in the comments here. Send me an email if you want me to get in touch with someone else and then just keep uh, having your notification switched on for that. That would be a very it's not a particularly elegant way to address this thing, but. It would work. Answers on a postcard. All right. Ryan says the last Kona low, we lost the Prindle hull. Oh, yeah, we saw that in Show Us Your Cat. Got sliced. Right. Lee's on board. I'm kind of making up for it because it sounds good. I don't know the, the context of what you're saying there, Lee. All right. Low says my Hobie 16 has quite a lot of hull movement. In other words, the boat flexes quite a bit. Any solutions to this? The pillars are solid, but it flexes. OK, this is going to be the last question, by the way. So no further questions because it is time for dinner over here in Greece um, and a drink. More importantly, yeah, with if you've got a lot of hole movement on your 16, there are a few things you can do to fix it. And it turns out, actually, that um, 
what I thought was pretty extreme used by the Australians isn't that extreme at all. And that is to actually epoxy your pylons, as we know, that's the upright parts out of the hulls, to the castings. That will take all of the movement out of there. But although it's done fairly widely, I would still be cautious about doing that. Two reasons. One, you never know when you're going to want to take your boat apart for whatever reason. Like if you damage a hull and you need to take it to a boat builder who wants to put it in his shed, if you can't take the hull off the boat, then you're not going to get it in the shed. Mm. Reason number two is that flexing of the hulls for older boats especially, maybe is necessary to stop too much strain going into other places. Where the pylons, if this is the hull, this is the pylon, this is the pylon inside the hull, and the pylon is set in a big old block of fiberglass like that, if there is no movement in the casting, then it means all of that stress that was, you know, we had this little bit of movement here, suspension, take that out. Where is that stress being taken? Perhaps it's being taken in here. And especially with an older boat, your boat, this pylon might start working itself loose inside the hull sooner if you epoxy your boat together. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but what I do know is if that happens, you've got some pretty major surgery your hull is going to have to go through um, to get it seaworthy again. So for that reason, I'm not the big fan of the epoxy. I'd love to try a 16 that has been epoxied to feel that stiffness must be a really glorious thing. So what is the solution? I hear you cry. Well, here we go. Oh, by the way, do you know about super stickers, everyone? At the bottom of the live chat, you can find one that says, it's got like a dollar sign on it. I think you know where this is going. Anyway, I'll just let that hang with you just while we finish off here. Um, so if this is the casting, this is not to scale. What you can do is there'll be a bit of a gap between the casting and the pylon, and that's what's giving it this flex. Um, you can pack that out with many things, but what I would generally go for is that kind of plastic packaging material that I th what would come packed in that. Like if you were to buy a an SD card, a USB stick, um, it's the sort of packaging that is quite annoying because you have to get your scissors out to open it up and then it's really sharp, quite thick plastic. But um, get that up there. Or you could get an old um, detergent container, cut that into strips, push the strips up there, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. That's what I'd go for, I think, uh, to take some of that flex out. Um, yeah. The other place the flex might be is your corner castings are riveted onto the beams. Maybe over time, they've become a bit loose. Give them a wiggle. You might have to take the boat apart to do that. But if so, just replace the pop rivets that holds it all together. Anyway. Just saying goodbye to everyone who's in the live chat now. That's about as much time as we've got for this week. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. And we've got Mark, who's just <laughs> saying hello in Northern Ontario, Canada. Great to have you with us, Mark. Um, hello and goodbye. Lee says, I quoted your comment earlier. It gave me a laugh. Oh, yeah, that was I'm kind of making it up because it sounds good. If you hadn't got that already, that's all I do on Joyrider TV. Uh, say it loud enough, people might believe you. Um, all right. Thanks very much to everyone. 
low says i think the last option is the most accurate for my boat yeah just i think the um detergent container cut into strips shove them up there see how that works um all right goodbye willis rewatch from the beginning thanks greg thanks low great to have you in involved i hope you will be back with us next week as will everyone and uh if you don't know what to do next uh, use your Friday to head over to totaljoyrider.com and get one of these jumpers. Now, with these jumpers, if you are in Australia, I only noticed this today. If you're in Australia or South Africa, um, email me because otherwise it will get shipped from USA. And I don't think you've got that sort of time. We can still get them, but I have to get them made specially for you. There we go. All right. Nice badge, Greg, says Ryan. Oh, yeah. They're, they're catching on. All right. Cheers, guys. Uh, have a great weekend. If you're going out sailing, get on the speed stick. There we go.